Hello everyone and welcome to the Collaborative Health Record webinar. My name is Melissa Wharton and I'm a marketing specialist here at TELUS Health for about six years now. I also have the pleasure of being your moderator for tonight's presentation. We're delighted to have you with us tonight and we hope that you'll enjoy this presentation. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Puni Seth. Puni, please go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you, Melissa. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. I'm uh, very excited to have this opportunity to, to speak to with everyone uh, with respect to uh, learning a little bit about the collaborative health record and what makes it different from other health record systems in the market and, and really the approach and philosophy behind, behind collaborative health. Um, again, as I mentioned, I'm very excited for this opportunity to be going through this discussion. And my hope is to be able to, to talk a little bit about what the platform is capable of doing, but more importantly, I'm sure everyone wants to see the platform itself. Um, I'm hoping to be able to show you some elements of what it's capable of doing as we go through the discussion, hopefully make this somewhat interactive. And then at the end, um, also to be able to hopefully have an opportunity to show you beginning to, to end what a clinical encounter within the CHR looks like. Before we dive into talking about the CHR, just a little bit briefly about myself, um, so everyone has, has context. Um, so I'm uh, Director of Clinical Engagement and Managing Principal here at uh, TELS Health and Collaborative Health. Um, I'm actually a practicing family doctor working in, in Toronto, Ontario over the past 10 years now. I graduated from McMaster University. Um, clinically, I've had the fortune of working in a wide variety of different practices. Uh, I worked as an uh, a hospitalist in a number of community hospitals in Ontario had a chance to actually uh, get to use a number of different hospital-based health record systems, so saw that side of, of digital health. Um, I also worked in an academic family practice and trained, of course, at McMaster Family Practice. Um, there I actually had substantial exposure to OSCAR. I've used OSCAR for about five years, so for those of you coming from OSCAR, I'll be able to highlight some differences between the CHR and OSCAR. And I've also practiced in, uh, in occupational health. But uh, now I run a community family medicine practice in downtown Toronto. It's part of the family health team and I utilize the, the collaborative health record in my own practice. On the technology side, um, I've also had the fortune uh, of being on the team that created the collaborative health record um, alongside co-founders, uh, Dr. Damon Ramsey, who's a family doctor at UBC and who's now vice president and chief medical information officer of TELUS Health. And uh, Sean Jung, who's our, our principal technology architect uh, and also is the co-founder of, of Input Health, as well as the, the brilliant team that we have across the board here at, at Health Health. And I've been using the CHR uh, really since its conception in my own practice. I'll also say that over the course of the last eight years working in this space, I've had a chance to meet many of you, um, literally to work with, engage, and, and meet hundreds of, of fellow physicians across the country. Um, and supported them in their decision to move on to the CHR and, and of course, to go through the uh, incredible change management process that is to, to move from one platform to another, uh, which has been a humbling and eye-opening experience. And many of those learnings have helped us build um, a streamlined and, and increasingly efficient system to be able to migrate people onto, onto the CHR. So let's start off by talking a little bit about health records and EMRs themselves. They're, of course, nothing new. Uh, majority of you here have, of course, used EMRs before, likely have used EMRs before if, uh, in, if you're not using them at, um, you know, at this point in time. And they played an important role in helping transform healthcare from a paper world to really what we'd like to say is a digital version of that paper world. And we've seen the many benefits that come with that. Uh, there's been a reduction of the utilization of paper, there's been things like the real-time receipt of labs and, and imaging. Um, there's been an easier ability to be able to submit bills. But as we know, this, this paradigm, this model has really been focused around the doctor and their computer. The EMR has really been focused on that central relationship. And knowing where we are in the 21st century and, and the ubiquity of mobile technology and, and the increasing amount of comfort people have to be able to engage with technology, um, EMRs have not been able to, as a platform, evolve with the changing needs of healthcare. And as a result of that, we of course see um, many platforms um, where people are 
in, uh, or integrating them or working with them alongside other solutions to bridge those gaps, whether it's virtual care, virtual care tools or e-referral tools or online employment booking tools. But the reality is that we know that healthcare teams have really changed themselves. We know that healthcare now, uh, and, you know, and it was uh, uh, Dr. Atul Gawande, who's the uh, general surgeon at uh, Brigham Women's Hospital in the US, and who of course writes for the New Yorker, um, who had said, healthcare is a, is a team-based sport, so why don't we start treating it like one? And, and we see that today where we look at healthcare teams and we see um, it's not just about the physician working alone. In many cases, there's so many healthcare teams that are independent of physicians, but importantly, there's allied health providers, there's mental health providers, there's pharmacists, there's support staff, there's nurses, there's a variety of evolving roles. And the question becomes, with the patient at the center of this, how do we think about platforms or systems that actually support care to be delivered in this fashion? So what, what it all really boils down to is the fact that we need tools that help us work better together, because ultimately we are doing something together with the patient and together as a team. And this has required us to go back to the drawing board in terms of thinking about what type of software uh, we need, and more importantly, what, what should that software be able to do? And lo and behold, the entry of the collaborative health record, the CHR. The CHR uh, is really what we've been able to accomplish in trying to achieve this vision. And it's an ongoing journey and, and an evolving platform. Uh, it, simply put, it's a modern cloud-based platform that allows patient and care teams towards, to work together towards better health. It's a recent addition to the TELS Health family. And importantly, it's a paradigm shift in how we think about electronic medical records. It's currently being used by thousands of healthcare providers across the country, from primary care clinics to specialist clinics to community healthcare centers and, and practices alike. Importantly, it's a true cloud-based solution. So there's no proprietary software that needs to be installed on local devices. Let's briefly explore the CHR a little bit further and um, highlight really what makes it different from the typical health record. There's no better way to do this really than to actually illustrate um, a patient journey or a patient story. And this is of course, uh, you know, a de-identified uh, patient based on someone that I had met in my own practice uh, in Toronto. Um, and let's use the journey of George as, a, as an illustration of the important ways in which platform can actually help us deliver better care. So George, a 59 year old male presented to my clinic uh, with a wide variety of concerns ranging from issues with his weight to concerns about his low mood um, to a recent diagnosis of diabetes that he wasn't sure how to manage and, and poor quality sleep in this uh, you know, possible diagnosis of sleep apnea that had been given to him. He was being cared for by a, a wonderful family physician in the community, but they retired well over a year ago. And now he was left sort of hopping between walk-in clinics and unfortunately making his way in and out of the hospital. I'm sure many of us are very familiar with this sort of a, sort of a narrative. Importantly, he was also living alone. He was in a financially difficult situation, um, and this made it extremely difficult for him to um, be able to perhaps have the necessary access to different services and modalities of care. So when, when you think about what somebody like, like George needs in order to be able to receive great care, he really needs a variety of, of skills and, and professionals to be able to support him. And we know that um, in, in George's case, he needs a a diabetes nurse. He required referral to a few different specialists, including a respirologist, nephrologist, endocrinologist, um, a mental health counselor. Um, we didn't have a patient patient navigator specifically, but certainly a patient navigator would be somebody that would be able to to help help George be able to better understand what sort of services are available to him that are uh, available through OHIP or that are available um, uh, covered by the province and. In order to be able to actually deliver and orchestrate this type of care, um, we really need to imagine what does the software platform need to be able to do and how can George really be kept in the loop with respect to everything that needs to take place. So this is where the CHR comes in. And the core idea of the CHR is that it promotes workflows that support team-based care. The idea is how can we better communicate with one another? How can we engage patients? Um, how can we facilitate communication and how can we do this in a way that recognizes that um, there are a wide variety of different types of roles uh, in terms of the people who, who uh, participate in a team. 
So they could be dietitians, they could be pharmacists, they could be physicians, social workers, combination of the above and others. And importantly, the way in which they need to interact with George's information may be different. So the, uh, the need or the, flex the flexibility to be able to actually have customizable access and permissions is an important fundamental part of 21st century care. And that's really at the underpinning of the CHR. So the CHR has this idea of care teams. You can have multiple different care providers who can uh, be part of the circle of care that a, a patient may have. And these care providers can have different levels of access and they can have different types of permissions. For example, uh, we might have prescriptions as being accessible by nurse practitioners and physicians, um, but other elements of the platform being, uh, such as prescriptions being restricted uh, to other care providers for whom it's not a relevant part of the system. And that control actually belongs to, to the clinic or the organization to be able to do that. Importantly, that team-based care also means internal communication taking place. So let me actually showcase what this looks like. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip over to um, the CHR here. And uh, for those of you seeing this for the first time, for the first time, this is indeed the collaborative health record. Um, before I talk a little bit about supporting team-based care, I'll, I'll give everyone a bit of a lay of the land in terms of what we're looking at. So um, to access the collaborative health record as a, a clinician or as a care provider or, or an administrator as part of a healthcare organization, it's done through Google Chrome. So it is a web-based application. As you'll see, and as I'll mention, patients don't have the restriction on Google Chrome. That's something specific to both security and, and optimization on the provider or clinic facing part of the platform. On the left-hand side, you can see a variety of different tabs that pertain to different core functions within the platform. We'll be going over some of these today as we talk about the platform, um, but importantly, it allows you to quickly navigate through different elements of the system, and that's the, the visual layout of the platform. But looking here actually at um, this part of the platform, which is patients, I can see that I'm looking at George's chart. And what I'm looking at is George's dashboard or the landing page. And this is really uh, similar to kind of the face sheet for those of you looking, thinking about paper uh, health records, and very similar to, to similar landing pages or dashboards in, in other health record systems. A key differentiator, and a few of the key differentiators, first of all, it's highly responsive. And aesthetically, as you can almost immediately tell, it looks quite different from your typical EMR. It has a modern, fresh aesthetic. Um, there's a clear visual layout. Things can be color-coded. And there's an ability to be able to actually uh, customize the layout of, the, of what you're seeing. So as a practitioner, for example, I, I might want to know what the patient's preferred pharmacy is and what their main location is. But others might not care for this. I might not care to have a referring practitioner here, so I can click hide on this. And this will hide not only that particular you know, widget or that particular module from George's chart, but really for all the charts that I'm accessing for patients across the platform. Um, and that customizability is user level. So this allows you to, to visualize the pieces of information that you need. Importantly, there's this core idea of the care team. And I can see who the different care team members are, be they individuals that are part of my practice. So this could be other users of the CHR within my clinic, or perhaps these are external providers. Um, and these are people that are in our contacts database that I've listed here. And whenever an encounter takes place, so there's communication that I need to go out to the care team, I now have a facilitated way to update those that are involved in the patient circle of care. Central to communication and collaboration is of course the idea of, uh, of an inbox. Now the inbox in the collaborative health record uh, has intentionally been made as being sort of your, your command center where you can see communication relating to incoming documents, could be tasks, perhaps tasks that I've assigned myself. It could be communication staff that are prioritized. Um, I have the ability to see lab results and so forth. And I have this ability to be able to create messages. Um, I can template the messages that I create so that I have ability to be able to do quick actions, which facilitate team-based communication. And as you can see, I can message entire care teams as well. So I might wanna message the medical team um, about um, some information relating to a patient and the capacity to do that and mark these things as urgent or perhaps attach them to a patient's chart. So that's communication and flow through an inbox. For those of you who used, uh, who've used things such as Gmail or Google Inbox even, 
Uh, this layout will be kind of familiar with the aesthetic of being able to have a single place for a wide different variety of uh, pieces of information to come in. Another very important mode of communication is, is what we call instant messaging. And the CHR actually has built-in instant chat. You can think that it was almost something like Slack built into the health record system. And I had this ability to be able to initiate conversations with team members. And this is distinctly different from messages and tasks because this floats uh, across the, uh, the screen. So I can be, for example, in the patient's chart. And if somebody needs to, for example, message me and tell me that you know, the next patient's running behind, take your time, I can actually see that alert without having to, to leave George's chart. So it allows for more real-time and fluid communication, either with an individual provider or with, with multiple providers. So let's flip back now um, and continue talking about the, the journey within the CHR. Another important part about collaborative and collaborative health record is the fact that the patient is included in the journey. So how do we include George in the journey um, of, of receiving his care through the CHR? You can think of the CHR as really being uh, a healthcare platform that has a wide variety of different patient engagement tools seamlessly built in. So think of all the different ways in, in which you might engage a patient. Um, this could be online appointment booking, this could be messaging, this could be file sharing, this could be perhaps getting digital consent, this could be doing an intake questionnaire or perhaps uh, a post-visit uh, satisfaction questionnaire. All of these different modalities are actually not only built into the collaborative health record, but actually work synergistically with one another to be able to drive efficiencies in how people can great clinical pathways and to be able to deliver care. So it's an immensely powerful way um, to engage patients without leaving the platform and without having to be concerned about multiple logins, uh, of course, without having to pay separately for different tools and applications. And this drives a lot of value in care. So flipping back to the CHR, um, let me show you a few of the ways in which patient engagement actually works in the platform. So within George's chart, I have this ability to be able to, for example, send a message to George. So I can click here, message George, and I can perhaps attach something from George's file. Perhaps there was some labs or some files that had come in or some forms that had been completed, and I want to send them to George. And I have some templated messages to say, um, you know, the lab results are normal, and I've attached that. And I can choose whether or not I want George to respond. So this is an important point um, because um, we know in many cases we're not looking to open a conversation but rather we're really just wanting to have a, a one-way or unidirectional flow of information. If I do want to initiate a conversation with George, I can click allow the patient to respond, and then George will receive a uh, communication that he's received a secure message, and he would be able to log into a patient portal and importantly, through uh, a patient app as well. So we have both the ability for patients to be able to access the patient portal through a web-based portal, meaning that they don't need to install an app, or for patients that are very comfortable and familiar and prefer mobile apps, we have both an, uh, an Apple iOS as well as, a, as an Android app that can be downloaded from the respective app stores. So patient messaging is one such way. And another way is actually through online appointment booking integrated within the CHR. So let's actually flip screens here for a moment and uh, let's pretend George was looking to, to book an appointment at the clinic. And let's say hypothetically, I'm working at a clinic called Waterfront Medical Clinic. So this is actually a generic view of our uh, online appointment booking interface within the CHR. And now I'm looking at it through the lens of a patient who perhaps went to the Waterfront Medical Clinic website, clicked on book an appointment, and was brought here. So first they specify whether or not they've been registered. And if they have been registered, they self-authenticate themselves. And there's two-factor authentication to allow them to securely enter the system. Or they say, uh, no, this, uh, I've never been here before. Now, as I'm going through these series of steps, I will note that everything you're seeing is customizable. Where there's options, um, you can also remove some of these options. You can narrow the stream of the different selections patients, patients can have. You can make online appointment booking only for new patients versus only for existing patients and so forth. So a tremendous amount of logic can be put in. So now let's say um, George wants to book at the Waterfront Medical Clinic. Um, and then George selects the primary reason for the visit or this is the main reason why somebody's coming in. Again, this workflow allows the patient to select that. You can also set up workflows where this is not required or there's a generic intake pathway. 
but this is a common example of uh, of an online appointment booking pathway, very similar to what I use in my own practice in terms of you know the top twenty or thirty reasons why people might be coming in for uh, for care. And of course, there there's an other and there's an ability. There's a generic triage as well. But let's say George is coming in for his diabetes follow up, and he's given an appointment type based on this logic. He can see available times. He can select the available times, and there's logic that's showing him the right appointment times based on this. And then if if the patient hasn't been there before, and let's say in this case, George hasn't been there before, George would enter his information, his date of birth, he would specify his sex and gender identity, uh, his preferred, preferred pronouns if needed. Um, and then importantly, his contact information so that we know uh, how to contact George. Keep, key piece here as well is preference for preferred method of notification. So, what, how does the patient prefer to be communicated with? Do they prefer email, SMS, combination of both? And if they're using an app, the ability to have app as a primary selection point as well. And then of course, to enter their identification number, or if we're talking about Ontario, let's say their, their OHIP number. So now, um, really quickly here, George verifies this information. Um, George understands that he's submitting a request for an appointment. This is where a customizable disclaimer could be inserted as well, and he submits this request. And at this point, this request has now been sent to the, the CHR, to the provider facing or the clinic facing side of the CHR. And this is where also the, the magic begins to happen because now we have one patient engagement modality, which is online appointment booking, triggering the next patient engagement modality, which is what we like to call QNAIRs or our digital health questionnaires. So George now sees an alert saying your appointment needs to be confirmed. In the meantime, we have two questionnaires we'd like you to complete. George can either skip for now, in which case he'll be reminded later, or he can start these pre-visit questionnaires. So because George had selected diabetes, he's going to receive a diabetes questionnaire. And of course, because we're in the times of a pandemic, all patients coming in for an in-person uh, visit perhaps also have a COVID screening questionnaire. So this is our digital health questionnaire system. Um, I'll briefly take you through this as an example, but um, and the, and these are template and, and sample questionnaires that we've built. We have about three or 400 of these tools pre-built within our library that range from uh, standardized tools to patient uh, outcome measurement scores, to consent, to patient education even. And importantly, um, these tools can create branching logic. So depending on the responses I provide, so let's say, for example, are you a healthcare worker? Yes, then it's asking me to type in what my healthcare profession is or no. So there's a logic that can be programmed in these tools. Importantly, these tools can be customized. So if you're, if you're a, a community healthcare organization uh, or uh, another community-based organization that's using proprietary tools or reporting tools, you have the ability to be able to build these directly into the platform. And that ability to edit and build these um, is actually made available to the organization. Uh, you don't have to go through us to, in order to build these tools. Um, we, of course, provide those services, but that, that control is there. Next, uh, there's a diabetes questionnaire. Uh, I'll go through this really quickly so you have an idea of what it might look like. but. Importantly, there's, there's about 15 different response types. So here we're seeing a few like uh, multiple select, there could be a single select, there could be date type, you can specify uh, a year or month or only you know, uh, one or the other. There's free text, of course. And um, at this point, uh, George finishes and this information comes back into the platform. Um, and George comes back to this landing page or is redirected to a different website. So we'll continue this journey in a moment and know that now all this information comes back into the platform. But this gives you a little bit of a taste of a few of the ways in which patient engagement um, can happen and how a patient like George can be included in that pathway. A platform for care delivery. So importantly, uh, we entirely recognize that, uh, especially you know, over the course of the last two years, the ability to be able to deliver care remotely or virtually has been an important part of practices. And for many, for many of us, it's been as simple as simply picking up the phone. And quite honestly, for myself, uh, phone calls have been the predominant way in which um, I've been delivering remote or virtual care. But there are ways in which you can deliver care um, asynchronously, meaning that communication is not happening at the same time um, that still constitute virtual care. And 
the CHR provides you with a broad range of different ways in which you can deliver virtual care, be it synchronous, such as uh, voice, such as video visits, for example, such as instant chat with the patient, all the way to asynchronous, which could be such as uh, having a um, non-real-time chat with a patient, almost like a secure email exchange. It could be file sharing. It could be sending the patient tasks, such as watch this video. Or um, it could be even having the patient complete a pre-visit questionnaire. All of these modalities represent different ways to deliver complete and holistic care to patients. And all of this is available within the CHR. There's no uh, external tools that you have to log into. There's secure embedded video within the platform. And the power of being able to have access to this at your fingertips is just incredibly game changing because you don't have to leave the patient chart. You don't have to be lost in a series of windows uh, in trying to, to deliver the best possible care. So let me give you a brief look at, at virtual care within the platform. So going back to, to the chart here, um, first of all, we can see here that um, there's a variety of different ways in which, as I mentioned, to be able to message the patient. But you can also uh, initiate virtual care by, by directly um, initiating the vid video call. I'm actually going to switch to a different screen here and show you an element of our platform that we call Pathways. So Pathways is a view towards being able to look at different stages of care. So you can think of Pathways as almost being um, a command and control center where you can see patients at different stages of care. Perhaps some are, are being triaged, uh, some are waiting to be seen in a virtual visit, some have completed a virtual visit, and you're actually able to see which patients are at which stage of care and what tasks or uh, bottlenecks that there are uh, associated with that. Um, I won't go too deep into this because there's quite a bit here, but I did want to highlight this because this is a hugely differentiating part of the collaborative health record. It, it dramatically sets it apart from other health record systems. Uh, it's very akin to a patient flow management system, really. Um, you can think of it as a CTAS board or air tra traffic control board, and it allows me as a provider to be able to see patients in different pathways, be it virtual care, Perhaps there's diabetes related pathways that I'm, I'm tracking. And importantly, I can actually click on a patient's chart. It'll take me to that specific pathway. And then I have a variety of different ways while I'm within the patient's chart to be able to engage in virtual care. That could mean, as I mentioned, assigning the patient a task. I could have them watch a video. I can see that the patient's already completed the consent. They've already uploaded a skin image. But I, I need them to also um, send additional pictures. For example, I can assign these tasks and they get sent to the patient through the patient app. Um, I have the ability to be able to have an instant chat with the patient, which the patient can receive and respond back to me. And of course, as you can see here, I have the ability to initiate a video chat. And when I click video chat, uh, importantly, first of all, you can see that the patient has agreed to, to consent to, to the video chat. So there's built-in disclaimers and consents for video visits. You can also see that their camera and microphone are enabled. Again, the intelligence here is that these are the common fail points of a typical virtual visit. We have these uh, checkpoints that allow us to be able to visualize that this has happened appropriately. When I click on start video chat, um, then it would actually initiate that. It's a lot asking me to uh, allow to be able to share my microphone and then the patient would pick up and be able to engage in the visit from here. So again, I can engage in that visit directly from within the patient's chart. Reporting and analytics. So obviously any platform in the, in the 21st century needs to have a strong data backbone and, and the CHR has an immensely versatile and structured um, database. And it also benefits from having a built-in data analytics engine that, that sits on the platform. The power of this is that we have the ability to be able to do real-time reporting, real-time visualizations, and also to be able to take actions on these visualizations. This is part and parcel of the platform. Again, not a separate system. This is something that um, users with, of course, the correct permissions are able to access and leverage right away. And this is enterprise-grade analytics. Um, we actually utilize uh, Google's Looker technology um, to be able to perform these visualizations directly within the database itself. So data is never actually leaving your account. It's actually doing the analysis directly within uh, the platform it's, itself. So it's uh, immensely powerful, 
and it allows for some real-time reporting as well. So let me give you a brief taste of what that reporting looks like. Um, I'm going to take you to this eye here at the bottom, which is the analytics uh, uh, engine in the platform. And we've built um, an array of common reports or dashboards that, uh, that are utilized in healthcare. So one example might be something as simple as appointments. So here I can see different filters, such as you know, the date range for appointments, appointments by practitioner, by status, by appointment type. For example, these can be customized. This is just an example. But I might want to say, what appointments have taken place over the last 120 days? And I want to run this report. And this will take a couple of moments, but this is actually going to, in real time, produce a visualization of all the appointments that have taken place on this demo account. And I can see them by status. So these many appointments um, are, uh, for example, um, rejected, of which you know four, four, uh, five have been rejected. I can see appointments by provider, which different providers have had different appointments. I can see a breakdown of how patients have been booking these appointments. So these are powerful reports that can be used in this case, obviously for operational and business purposes. But as you'll see in a moment, these uh, powerful analytics dashboards can also be used to look at patient care. Um, I'll also highlight that. Um, these are interactive and you have access to the data that you're reporting on. So if I want to look at, for example, who are these 16 patients that canceled? I can click here and it pulls a report and I now have a breakdown of which patients canceled, what their phone numbers are, perhaps I can download the CSV. Or perhaps this is a more sophisticated report that I need to provide to my uh, to the to the payer uh, or, or the funding agency that's funding my clinic, the platform allows you to be able to, to download these data sets uh, if you have correct permissions. Similar, so as you can see, there's a wide variety of uh, you know business dashboards such as billing and so forth, but I'll, I'll highlight one or two others just to uh, speak to the power of the system. One is uh, being able to look at, for example, outcome data over time. So let's say, for example, I looked at, um, we have a, a tool called the PHQ-9 or the Depression Self-Assessment. And maybe I want to see in the last, let's say, 200 days, um, what's been happening with, with the PHQ-9 and, and across this account. So I can see here that these are the QNAIR response trends over time. Uh, I can see the totals. I can see the average score over time. I can see the average score by age. I could even see a trend of the, of the scores over time. And therefore, let's say uh, my organization had created a new um, program and it was a, a group counseling program and this, that group counseling program started in June. I would now have the ability to actually in real time look at what these what the outcomes were um, uh, based on patient reported outcomes or other metrics in the platform directly through the system. So again, immensely powerful with respect to what, what can be done even on a clinical basis. Last but not least, there's the ability to be able to actually do uh, what we call mass actions directly through the, the platform as well. So what this means is we can um, take an, an action such as let's say we filter for all patients that have diabetes that have not had a hemoglobin A1C in the last six months. Um, and I could actually pull that report and directly through the analytics dashboard actually have everyone sent a questionnaire that reminds them uh, and provides them patient education on the importance of completing their lab, uh, their, their lab requisitions as an example. So you can actually take actions at a platform and population level directly through the analytics engine. Hugely powerful. This is obviously the result of this being embedded within the platform itself. And importantly, um, the CHR is a single platform that allows for collaboration uh, to occur across a jurisdiction, across a region, across an organization, and respect to the fact that that organization could perhaps be distributed over multiple different physical or virtual, virtual uh, points. So within the CHR, and I'm going back here, um, I can see, for example, that right now when I can click on the top left-hand corner, I can see I'm logged into um, this specific location, but I could change locations. And the idea would be that if I change to, let's say, Algonquin as a different location, um, it would actually change my schedule. It would change my letterheads. It would be almost as if I've logged into that location. So the key idea is the platform has the ability for you to manage multiple disparate locations within one platform itself, hugely powerful. And we're, we're working with, um, uh, actually, uh, and, and this is public news at this point in time, but uh, the collaborative health record is, is being deployed currently in, in the province of PEI. 
um, and uh, the, and it's already gone live in, in multiple jurisdictions there. But you can imagine as a similar example, um, all of those different clinics and sites and organizations are hosted on one platform. So the, the power in terms of what can be done uh, with it from a data perspective, from a standardization perspective, from an efficiency and quality perspective is quite immense. And designed to be able to evolve and to be able to evolve in step with practice. So we know how quickly uh, new technologies roll out. Uh, we also know how quickly um, technology standards change. Uh, we know that increasingly um, more and more elements of uh, our patient population are utilizing wearables. Uh, they're perhaps using other technologies. Uh, they're using other web-based tools to be able to, to risk stratify and to be able to screen or to be able to access care. So a, a core and fundamental part of the CHR is to be designed to be able to evolve and to be able to be iterative. So, um, and you can speak to really uh, anyone having utilized the CHR um, it is not a static platform. Um, we um, release new updates uh, with, with uh, you know, immense frequency, uh, of course, doing so in a way that's not disruptive, but importantly, um, you can be assured that the latest available technologies that are, that are out there uh, will be utilized within the platform. Um, so as an illustration, as an example, and this is, this is simply hypothetical, uh, we might look at something like a dashboard in the future where we can see data coming in from a variety of different patient-driven sources, like let's say the amount of sleep they're getting through their sleep trackers or the amount of uh, steps they're getting through their step counters um, as an illustration. But the important thing is the CHR as a web-based platform and specifically as a platform that's modular, it's designed to be able to replace certain modules, upgrade them as newer technologies become available and to, and to be able to evolve. So you're not locked into a specific platform that way. And we've had, you know, the uh, immense privilege of working with leading institutions uh, across Ontario, across Canada, really across uh, across the globe, including the U.S. Uh, some of these are highlighted there, and you'll also see that many of these organizations um, are, you know, mid to large sized organizations. We of course work with small and independent uh, groups and providers as well, but we have the capacity and the experience to deliver at scale whether it's delivering at the scale of a province, uh, of a health system, um, and the learnings that we've had in working with the range of different care providers allow us to be able to uh, continue to improve uh, and, and further streamline our ability to be able to, uh, to deliver on these services. So um, before going further, before, you know, uh, I know we wanted to leave at least five or 10 minutes for some Q&A, for those of you with questions, uh, feel free to type those within um, the uh, the chat Q and A. But I, I wanted to to follow up on on George, the patient that we were speaking of, and also kind of illustrate what it might be like to go through a clinical encounter within the CHR, sort of beginning to end, because we know that this is something that's commonly asked, and it is uniquely different within the CHR relative to other uh, health record systems, such as Oscar, for example. So now let's say. Um, We'll go to schedules. So schedules is where we can, of course, view uh, appointments. And you can see that there's a, there's a variety of different filters here and the ability to flip between the schedules of different locations or the schedules for different teams or groups. Perhaps I want to look at the allied health schedule, or perhaps I want to filter and only look at my schedule. So immense amount of flexibility there. I could look at day, day view or week view, and I could see a very clean color-coded visualization of what appointments have been completed, uh, what type of appointments are there based on color coding, and, and what lies ahead. So now let's, uh, you can see here on the left-hand side um, that the requested appointment from George has come in. So you can see George has requested this visit. So this was the, the online appointment booking request from before. When I click on this, it actually takes me to that day on the calendar. Uh, I can see George's information here. Um, and I can see that this is a physical visit, but you can also see there's the ability to be able to toggle between physical and virtual. And I can also see other information, such as the fact that George has completed his pre-visit questionnaires um, and, and see other relevant points of information. When I click confirm, this appointment can be confirmed. So this would be, now these steps were typically uh, completed by an administrator, but I wanted to highlight this and show this for the purposes of completing that cycle of how a online, a requested online appointment actually gets confirmed and appears within the platform. 
But switching back to the, v the week view, let's say this is George here for a diabetes follow-up. And let's actually go to the schedule for this particular day. So I'm going to go to the 23rd. So I'm on the 23rd. I can see George has arrived. And you can see here that the staff can change the status to George being in a specific room. So perhaps he's in room number two. This gets updated in real time. So if you have users on multiple different platforms um, or multiple different devices, as one gets updated, all of them get refreshed in real time in terms of the status of appointments and perhaps room status. But as a provider, um, if I want to initiate this appointment, all I have to do is click on, um, again, the actual appointment on the schedule and click on encounter. And you'll see a number of different automations that take place. First of all, um, the platform has gone from schedules to the patient chart. It's opened George's chart. It's created a new encounter for the reason of a diabetes visit. It's loaded a, a diabetes encounter template, which you can see in the background here, because indeed George is coming in for uh, a diabetes related visit. And you can see here, this is where the platform becomes immensely powerful, that it's detected that George completed a type 2 diabetes questionnaire, which was the one that you saw me complete, and that there's a natural language paragraph, basically clinical text, that is being extracted from the responses that George provided. So watch what happens when I click Attach. Looking at the back here, you can see the history. When I click Attach, you can see uh, type 2 diabetes q &R, September 22nd timestamp. This is actually all of the responses from George's questionnaire. So George's responses from his questionnaire converted into a clinical note um, and is presented in a clean, what we call clinical syntax, clinical format. Um, and this is all done without me having to lift a finger. So this is a, a, you know, a win, win, win situation in that you know, the patients had an opportunity to provide information prior to the visit, in many cases actually receive education through the questionnaire itself. As I mentioned, you can embed videos and images directly through the tool itself, use it as an educational tool as much as a data collection tool. You can see that as a clinician, this has saved me an immense amount of time because the basic clinical history has already been taken, frequency of glycemic checks, whether or not he's had low blood sugars, whether he's having side effects to medications and so forth, any questions that George might have, all of this has been inserted here. And this is actually being provided to me in a format that respects structured data. So this is not just free text that's here. In the back end of the platform, each of these responses that George provided actually maps to a data point in our relational database. And that's information that can be extracted, that can be analyzed, that can be used for quality assurance, reporting, research, hugely powerful. And this introduces an immense amount of time savings from a clinical perspective. Um, overlaid with the natural language coming from the actual questionnaire is the encounter template. So here you can see it's automatically pulled in all of this information um, from the note. And what I'll actually do is, because sometimes going through this, this can have appeared very quickly, um, because uh, indeed, with a single click, all of this happens in an automated fashion. Let me actually slow this down for the purposes of demonstrating what, what actually happened. But let's say I create a new encounter. Um, and again, a new encounter, when blank, simply looks like this. So this is an, a blank encounter template. The platform had automatically applied the diabetes encounter template. And you can see that it does so in a history, examine and assessment and plan format. And you can see that that's visible here. You'll also see that it automatically pulled in um, information from George's chart into that encounter template. So George's active medications, his vaccinations, his lifestyle review, uh, his social history, uh, whether or not he's had an eye exam and so forth. Um, and then the last, last but not least, it had also um, inserted information from the, the uh, questionnaire that George completed. So all of these things happened with the click of a single button, which was click on start encounter from within the schedule and your note gets pre-populated. So what does an encounter look like with the patient as a result of that? Well, what happens is essentially, if I'm seeing a patient in person, I now turn the screen towards the patient and say, first and foremost, I acknowledge the fact that they've provided me with this useful information for the visit and say, thank you for completing the questionnaire. It sounds like you have some questions about whether or not there's any new medications. Let's talk a little bit about that. But let's, let's perhaps review some of what you've said. 
So I can now look at the patient, uh, I can make a thera therapeutic connection instead of having to worry solely about documentation. Um, in terms of how you interact with the encounter template itself, you can of course uh, type, so I can, I can type and correct anything anywhere. Um, we also have these buttons that we call uh, instant variables. So this allows me to select from structured data points. So again, not free text, but if I wanna talk about nutrition, I might say he follows a diabetic diet, he limits added sugars and so forth. Again, structured data. Or I could use any type of voice to text platform. Um, and let's see if this actually works. Sometimes when we're on a, uh, on a webinar, it, it doesn't enable voice to text, but you can see here that I'm using something as simple as the built-in operating system voice to text, and I'm able to do that directly into this note. Um, so you're able to dictate directly into the note. Similarly, there's an exam section. Here I can add vital signs. Um, I have the ability to be able to pull in things like lab results uh, that might be relevant and recent to come into the note itself. Uh, I can, of course, add additional elements for the exam. Um, and then, of course, the assessment and plan. And I can see that given that this was a diabetes visit, it's already selected uh, OHIP Diagnostic Code 250 or, or whatever diagnostic library we're utilizing. I could add an additional code. It'll, it's intelligent, so it'll pick recent diagnostic codes used for this patient. Or I can search and I can say, okay, let's look for fibromyalgia. And it, I can find fibromyalgia if I need to put in two diagnostic codes. I also have my assessment and plan structured and templated for me. So I can say, you know, blood sugars are on target, um, blood pressure is also on target. Um, some lab tests were ordered, including the following, um, and, you know, we'll follow up in four months. So the ones that I need, I can click on. When I sign this note, the remainder will disappear, but this just makes it super fast for me to be able to provide a structured uh, note. And importantly, when we're talking about a large organization or a group of care providers, it allows you to structure care it allows you to structure um, standard of care and quality of practice across different providers as well. Now, I'll also highlight, and, and, and I'll briefly go through one or two other items within the encounter note before I stop and open for questions. Um, but you can see here on the left-hand side, there's what we call the summary screen. So this is um, a visualization of key parts of the patient chart um, that are made available to me directly from within the, within the patient's um, Encounter. So, as a brief navigation in terms of in terms of what I'm looking at, when I click on dashboard, it brings me back to the dashboard. When I click on on this encounter, it brings me back to the encounter. I can see the most recent encounters. Uh, I can also see, you know, uh, George's medical history, his active meds, allergies, social history, so forth. Essentially, this is your CPP. Uh, for those of you who's, you've used Oscar, this represents kind of the the variety of different. Uh, boxes um, that are found around the encounter template. Um, and this is the format that it's visible in. And for those that don't need to see the summary screen, I can hide the summary screen and make the encounter full screen, or I can bring it back to, to myself and make it visible there. And where I want to see more information about previous visits, this is entirely customizable. So maybe as a practitioner, I prefer to um, have, uh, let's say, medical history higher up here. So I'm going to put it here. Therefore, medical history is here. Now for all of my patient charts, I can see the medical history here. And this setting is per user, and it remembers this information um, across all patient charts. So again, a quick way to not only view different parts of the chart, but to quickly actually navigate and enter information. So I could, for example, add something to the medical history directly through here as well. Um, lastly, on the bottom of the um, encounter below, you know, the, the, the history exam and assessment and plan are things such as prescriptions, attachments, referrals, injections, the ability to be able to do automated follow-up, such as, let's say, a post-visit questionnaire, and of course, automated billing. So we integrate into a variety of different uh, public billing systems. Um, it knows that this visit uh, is likely a K085, uh, given that this is a diabetes visit. Um, and when I sign the note, it automatically sends this bill to the ministry. There's lots more that we can that uh, that we can go through, and, and lots more to uncover with respect to efficiencies and parts of the platform. But I wanted to give everyone just a very high level taste of what the interface of the CHR looks like from the clinical perspective. Um, and of course, we're happy to arrange uh, demos and 
and product tours for those of you interested in seeing this in more detail. But I'm cognizant of time and uh, I acknowledge that there's only uh, nine minutes left. So maybe we'll pause here and uh, we'll entertain any um, uh, glaring questions that have come up from, from the group on the chat. Yeah, so thank you very much, Puni, for a great presentation. Um, as Puni said, it is time for our Q&A session. So let's move on to our first question. Um, all right. I like that it looks like everything is included in the core product and integrated. Are there any additional costs for, the, for any of these modules? Um, it's a sing single, that's a fantastic question. Thanks for that yeah. question. Um, you know, one of the major value propositions of the CHR is that it's single license, single product. Um, uh, there are license tiers on the basis of whether or not you're, let's say for example, a prescribing clinician that requires access to, you know, billing in the prescriptions module uh, versus let's say um, uh, an al allied healthcare provider that may not need those different uh, elements of the platform. but it's all in one pricing in terms of everything you've seen. You don't pay uh, anything separately for the patient engagement functionality. So uh, Im immensely powerful from that perspective in terms of what you're getting. Thank you very much, Puni. So along with our next question, um, I find a lot of my patients hesitant to adopt some of these uh, types of tools. Do you use all of the tools in your practice? If so, what has been your experience with the patient adoption? What percentage of your patients use the online booking and complete the assigned questionnaires? That's a great question. Uh, we get asked this question a lot. Um, and you know, the answer is really, I individualize things to patients. So I certainly do utilize all of the patient engagement functionalities that I've shown today, and, and there are many more. Um, but what I use for a given patient really comes down to um, that conversation, that decision with that patient. Um, I always bring it down to whatever helps provide the best possible care for that individual and, and um, that allows for efficiency and uh, that allows for um, ease of care delivery for all participating uh, individuals. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of uptake and adoption of different um, uh, Patient engagement technologies, this will vary from population to population. In, in my practice in downtown Toronto, I'd say, for example, 80, 70 to 80% of patients will complete pre-visit questionnaires. And there's different strategies for how we can, you know, and we've done a lot of work like this literally, uh, you know, for the last eight years, I've been working with organizations to help them optimize patient engagement utilization and things like maximizing utilization of intake questionnaires. So there's strategies on how you can optimize that. but. Of course, at the end of the day, um, you know, I've also practiced in Woodstock, Ontario and, and other rural communities where, you know, I did see uh, a slightly less uptake. So it'll vary from population to population. But um, the important point is you have the tools at your disposal and um, being able to provide a more efficient service to one patient really means more, more time and availability for whatever works best for the other patients. Thank you very much, Puni. Um, so let's continue with our questions. Um, all right. Can you expand a little more on uh, the included reporting? Our team is very focused on data output, so I'm wondering what standard reports are included? Do you have the ability to make your own reports? Absolutely. So actually, while we talk through this, um, I can certainly uh, bring us to that to that screen as well. But uh, absolutely, there are. Um, you have a library of several um, several dozen. Actually, I'm not sure of the exact number right now, but it's probably uh, more than several dozen um, dashboards that we've pre-built and that are standardized and made available to clients. Um, importantly, we work with organizations that have specific reporting needs to build custom reports. So that configurability, customizability is absolutely there. And really any information in the platform that's collected in a structured format, you can report on. So um, whether it's uh, you know, care info from an encounter, whether it's lab info, uh, whether it's structured diagnostic info you've received, whether it's billing info, appointment info, messaging, um, and so forth, it's, it can all be reported on. And even things like, for example, calculations such as uh, average referral wait times for different programs. So more involved um, um, 
platform uh, dashboards can be made, including things like also scheduling hours. So what's availability for a given provider? What's the, the utilization of a provider's available time to the time, for example? Thank you very much. Um, all right, let's continue with our questions. Um, you showed how we can create different roles within the platform. Uh, we have a lot of different roles in our team, but not everyone needs to access the, to the entire record. Uh, what levels of privacy can be enabled between different users? Wonderful question. Um, and you know, and this is obviously a hugely um, important topic. Um, really briefly, and I'll go into the uh, settings element of the of one of the demo accounts here. You can see here that we have the ability to to build different roles. And in this example, there's clinical pharmacist, super user, research coordinator. So you can build these roles, and then you can define which parts of the platform an individual user can have access to. So who can perhaps unlock encounters versus access encounters versus edit encounters versus create a prescription and so forth. So tons of different um, permissions that are here. Uh, now you can also restrict um, pay access to patient charts on the basis of individual patients. So actually I'll switch back here for, uh, for ease. But for example, in George's chart, I might make it such that uh, it's only accessible to um, certain groups. Or I might, right now, for example, George is accessible to all users. Maybe I'll only make George accessible to these four users. Or perhaps I actually want to drill down even further. Perhaps I want to have accessibility limited at the level of an encounter. I can go and restrict this particular encounter to only be accessible by particular providers, unless of course they break the, the glass box, and they need to access it for care purposes. Everything is of course audit logged. And we're also continuing to build and evolve more complex role-based access controls, as well as location-based access controls. So for groups that have, let's say five different locations, and you want to restrict who can access um, the records for a particular location, um, that, that sort of work can be done as well. Thank you very much, Puni. Uh, we do have one other question. Um, you showed patient messaging directly through the solution, and we turned off the capabilities for patients to directly message us. Absolutely. So first of all, um, lots of control. So, you know, you don't have to utilize the patient portal or patient, patient messaging um, for all patients. So you can restrict it at a, at a patient level as well. And then at the level of an individual conversation, as I mentioned, you can determine whether or not you want the patient to respond. Once you, when you, for example, want a patient to respond, but then you want to close the conversation, you're able to do that. So you can absolutely stop a patient from being able to respond uh, and control the situations in which certain patients being able to respond. Lots of control there. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Pumi. So there are no more questions uh, in the queue. Our webinar has now come to an end. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for participating and we hope you enjoyed the presentation and found the information valuable. Uh, as well, if you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us at telussales.emrs at telus.com or you can visit our website at uh, teluschealth.com slash chr. So with that, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care.